Welcome to the Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day, and particularly the power of governments and companies. So everybody who works at PI is essentially a news junkie, and we spend a remarkable amount of our free time looking around to see what's going on in the world. And in light of COVID-19, as you know, all the news is about COVID-19. So we're constantly going through the news and seeing what developments there are around the world. And I'm here with my colleague, Edin Omanovich, whose job it is to bring this all together. Edin, just for our background, is our um, advocacy director who has spent years hunting down the surveillance industry around the world and uh, for a number of years also led a lot of our work on government surveillance. And lately, he's been focusing a lot of his energies in the same way that many people are looking at COVID-19 and importantly, governments and companies' responses. Um, so we, on our website, we have a what we call a tracker where we summarize a lot of these key stories as they come in. And helpfully, a number of uh, people uh, from well, a lot of listeners and people who receive our mailings often get in touch with us to let us know of some of the stories they're seeing as well. And so we group all these stories together by trends just to see what's going on in the world. And in my brighter moments, I think that actually we're at this wonderful moment in history where as we deploy technology as a solution to a global challenge that we're being really serious and thoughtful. Okay, I can't continue that line. It just doesn't make sense. It's not at all true that we're being serious and thoughtful when it comes to the deployment of technology, is it, Edin? Um, well, I, I think there's some uses that that might apply, but generally, no. Um, it's quite interesting seeing the trends that and how they've changed. So I think a couple of months ago, um, everyone was just really fascinated with the use of data from telecommunications operators. So the big telcos, whoever you're registered to, tracking your location. Um, and that seems to have kind of died down. There's not many reports of that. Instead, what everyone's focusing on now is the apps. So the various types of apps that people are monitoring. Um, and again, some of these are have a role. Some of them might end up to be quite useful. A lot of them will be misguided and a lot of them will be dangerous also. Have you, have you seen any in particular that you've been quite interested in? Well, of course, there's the whole Apple, Google uh, app, let's say infrastructure that they're developing, which um, from what I can see uh, is, it's almost thoughtful. It's almost, uh, what a reasonable response could be around the use of tech and a security aware, privacy aware, uh, broad user basis and equity aware approach to the question uh, to the question of using apps to help detect who's around you. Well, to, to detect if you've interacted with somebody who's become unwell. Um, unfortunately, and to very little surprise to most people who would listen to this podcast, governments aren't as excited about the Apple Google solutions because it doesn't allow them to get all the data. And that's what we've seen with uh, Australia, um, who launched their app um, just a few days ago. Um, their app is a centralized app, kind of like how the Singapore app was about the Singaporean authorities uh, getting the data of who's interacted with who um, and help trying to help to contain the virus accordingly. Whereas the Apple and Google infrastructure wouldn't make this data easily available to authorities. Um, but then there's, uh, I, I think I've been seeing some stories about India's app and um, didn't you mention there was an app in Turkey as well? So, so Turkey is developing one. Tur I think there's three types of apps that we've seen. The ones that purport to provide advice to people. So for example, what kind of symptoms are you showing or where's your nearest hospital? The apps which essentially do contact tracing in digital forms. So if you've been around somebody for a certain amount of time, the idea is that if you get then infected, you're able to tell that person that you're infected and that they should quarantine also, or apps that are used to like actually enforce the quarantine. So say that I'm infected, the police want to know that I stay at home. There's apps that are being used for that also. And uh, Turkey's essentially all three. So it's the kind of thing they're running with is that it allows people to know where local facilities and services are. 
Um, but if you look at it, it's also providing security forces with access to people's information and it also is trying to do contact tracing. So it's kind of a three in one app, whereas we've seen other countries tend to focus on individual types of applications. Yeah, and, and this, that's just such a colossal mistake to try to merge the three purposes together. Um, I was speaking to a, uh, a government agency um, about their app and I, I can't tell if they accidentally let it slip or uh, it was they were just thinking out loud about how their app could be used to say, for instance, notify you if you've been interacting with too many people and to nudge you in a certain way. And that that's a very different kind of app from an app that uh, would help to inform health authorities on how to respond to uh, to the outbreak. Instead, this is an app to try to shape your behavior. And it's only like one flip of a switch away from being an app that reports on you if you've been breaking lockdown. And like that, that's just like, that's confusing to human beings who are going to download an app they think that might help them. And lo and behold, it might actually report on them. Mm, totally. I mean, and the thing is, like, the trust here, the public trust is like absolutely vital at the moment. So if you're going to need like the vast majority of people to download the app, they need to have trust in it and that it's actually being used for a public health purpose and not being used for security purposes or any other reasons. Um, and, and like, I mean, you mentioned the Indian app earlier, we're already seeing initiatives like that, that ostensibly rolled out on a voluntary basis with some legitimate purposes, then increasingly being used as um, for mandatory purposes. So people being told that they then need that app in order to access services and so on. So that's this kind of risk of function creep, not in terms of just what services get access to it, but in terms of when you need that app to access and just to go around your normal life, basically. Yeah, like it won't be a surprise if all of a sudden employers start demanding that their staff have the app on them, for instance, in order to somehow manage their liabilities. But uh, equally, um, I think these apps put people in a very awkward position when it comes to their employers. So like say, um, I have a contact tracing app and the app notifies me that I've interacted with somebody who, has, uh, who thinks that they have uh, the virus um, and that the app somehow recommends, doesn't require, but recommends that I, uh, I lock myself down. Um, will my employer actually believe that? Will my employer look at the app and say, hey, well, okay, you can stay at home for two weeks. Yeah. I'm not sure if the, the designers of these, these pretty tech solutions have thought through how this actually works in people's lives. No, nah, totally. And, and the, the kind of workplace surveillance that we're moving towards has got a lot of interest so increasingly a lot of journalists are getting in touch about that because it could be a good way of identifying people um, who are for example immune that's the kind of thinking that governments are currently at so they're trying to think about a post-lockdown phase where people who might be eligible to go back to work either because they've been tested or they believe that they're immune would somehow have to certify um, or prove that they've got that status. So where, if you have a very decentralized approach where you have, for example, public services or workplaces being able to monitor their staff, these employers could be actually responsible for doing the testing and for certifying that their workforce um, is clear from infections. So you're seeing a move towards potentially mass scale workplace surveillance as a result of this. And I think we've had a few inquiries regarding that already. Can you imagine if employers are involved in testing? Like just to be clear that the current test for whether or not you have the 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 virus is putting a swab up your nose or into your throat. So an employer can be doing that. And then uh, the the test for whether or not you've had the virus involves uh, pricking your finger and taking blood from you. These are generally two barriers uh, that employers have not been able to pass recent, uh, in modern history. This is going to be a complete sea change in, in the employment relations sector. So, I mean, just for the record, you're not putting a swab up my nose. Um, <laughs> you're I mean, first in the line. <laughs> you're supposed suspect. <laughs> 
<laughs> the fact that I've long wanted to do some form of punishment towards you, this is only a great health excuse for me to do so. Exactly. I mean, you can just ask. This is one of these things that, like, an employer can just ask their workforce whether or not they've been tested and build it up through trust. And yeah, that's the thing about these. Um, we're also seeing a lot of interest in um, temperature scanners in the workplace. It's like, first of all, you could just ask your colleagues if they're not feeling well. Yeah. And second, you could just give them sick leave if the answer is yes. If they're showing up to work with a fever and they're feeling horrible and they want to lie to you and the only way you can detect whether they're lying is through a temperature scanner, then they don't feel comfortable telling you that they're not well. Maybe you're a shit employer. <laughs> and I guess I guess the example we've already seen of that is Amazon in the UK, which the warehouse has its own problems. But all of this is, of course, based on the assumption that there's going to be wide scale testing available. Um, and that's just not a certain thing yet. Um, and like a lot of the like, fuss around this is this idea that we're going to have immunity certificates. So like in the post lockdown phase that people are just going to be walking around with um, provable health status, whether it's a employer or a government authority, or even in China, public service, like public transport, demanding that you prove your health status. Um, and that's the kind of future that people are thinking about we might have to endure. And it, it, it's, it is like, whether it's the piercing of the finger, the, the, the swabbing of the throat, or the, 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 the carrying around of a certificate. Like for the first time in, in my career, I am starting to see the dystopia. You know, even after 9 11, I didn't see the dystopia. I just saw, yeah, this is going to suck badly for a long time, but we will c come back from this because we're not going to cross a few, a few lines other than, well, torture and mass detention and war but here we're 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 talking about essentially changing the human condition like people are going to be trying like th their livelihoods will depend on getting a certification uh, and will be dependent on getting a test which is hard to get in the first place and gain that certification and and so the black market for this will be immense the pressure to do like i just don't think again the people who want to Pr propose these solutions and sell these solutions. I don't think they've thought these things through. Uh, not at all. And like the other area that we're seeing is um, this idea that a lot of people will be working remotely afterwards also. So then how do employers monitor the work rate of their employees? Well, there's a lot of companies who are now selling monitoring solutions so that if you're an employer, you can see your um, employees screen to see how much work they're doing, see how many times they're away from their desk and um, computer and so on. And these kind of tools are going to be really popular also. Now, there's been a lot of interest uh, in the media lately around the surveillance industry. So they have reared their ugly heads. Um, and as our surveillance industry expert, I'm, I'm curious, what's the latest you've been seeing that's interesting? I think the most important one recently was um, this report in Reuters about comm surveillance companies. So these are companies who traditionally sell to law enforcement or government for law enforcement purposes. Um, and there's hundreds of these around the world. And you, some people might have heard of, for example, Palantir or NSO Group, um, who sell traditionally specifically for these purposes. Now coming out, and marketing their products as essential in the fight against COVID-19. Um, so, for example, the Reuters report pointed out Celebrite, which is an Israeli-based company which sells to, I think like they claim to have over 150 um, customers in 150 countries, um, which do mobile phone extraction. So, for example, if a law enforcement authority gets hold of a device, they plug it into the Celebrate software, and then that does a forensic examination of the device and allows the agency to see what's inside and to do analysis through that. They're now selling this as a tool for contact tracing of COVID-19. So because they can do that analysis within the device and they have a map, essentially, um, for example, of a person's location history, they're then trying to repurpose that 
as a tool specifically for COVID-19. So you can see how these big surveillance companies have got their um, kind of finger in these pies also. Jesus Christ. I'm just for a little bit of uh, self-advertising. We, we have a podcast specifically on mobile phone extraction where we cover technologies such as Celebrite's highly invasive uh, technologies. And, and so Celebrite's uh, use case or the types of use cases for mobile phone extraction is usually when your phone is seized. So we're imagining already uh, an environment where policing is involved in, in a health emergency, which is uh, quite frightening. Um, so there's Palantir, there's NS. What's what's NSO Group up to? The NSO Group sells very targeted spyware, which is used to take control of the device and exfiltrate the data from it. And um, what they're briefing journalists is that similarly to Cellbrite, they have what is essentially a GUI, so a map of people's locations. And they're using that to pitch their product. Um, and apparently they're in talks with governments, but it's not known who these potential clients are. Uh, that's around the world. In Israel, they're apparently working with the defense ministry to develop a risk analysis system. So depending on your movements and how many times you might have been exposed to someone, the idea is that their software would be able to rank you on a scale of one to 10, similar to, for example, the earlier app that China rolled out at the start of the year, which is like a um, traffic light system. So Israel's one would have you on a scale of one to 10, but it's not known you know, ever if this will ever get rolled out. Um, I mean, quite frankly, this could just be an opportunity for these companies to trade on the fact they're a surveillance company um, and willing to help in the fight against COVID-19, but it doesn't actually mean that their services are ever gonna be needed or that it's ever going to be rolled out it's just a good way for them to launder their reputations and to get some attention yeah indeed and um just one last company i want to ask about just because um uh there's this company called clearview ai which became highly celebrated after the new york times uh wrote an excellent piece about two months ago looking into the company and where they've been selling their ai facial recognition systems and then subsequent reporting um has seemed to indicate there are links between clearview and the far right what's their role are they, are they just playing up the usual we can track people type so of again it's, it's it's a system that's not designed for this whatsoever it's a facial recognition network They've hoovered up a bunch of people's faces from online sources, including social media, um, and then selling it to governments as a way to match individuals against their database. Um, so they're saying they're apparently in talks with the US to offer this as a solution, again, for um, tracking people and for enforcing the quarantine, but it's unknown whether this will actually come to fruition ever. Okay, okay. And then what else? What's next? What do you got for me? Well, you got to make me start feeling better because uh, you got some feel good stories in here. Um, I think, well, so, I mean, there's good things in everything. So, for example, the Australian app now seems like it's um, going to be forced onto people in a way that they weren't expecting. So there's been calls by the prime minister that people are kind of being forced to download it, even though it's apparently voluntary. Uh, but earlier this week, they did say that they were gonna pass legislation to prohibit the law enforcement forces in Australia from accessing the data, um, which I think is a smart move, considering that all of the rollouts are based on public trust. So if you want people to trust the app, um, all the polls that we've seen have shown that people are gonna be far more willing to hand over sensitive health data to public health agencies rather than security agencies. So I think that's a good example of a firewall um, that might be effective. I think some other relevant news, so Israel, um, which has rolled out various apps, it's given various agencies powers to take location data from the operators and to um, do their own location tracking. A number of these have been um, subject to legal challenges. So the access by the police in Israel was found to be unlawful just simply because it just wasn't effective or proportionate. Access by the Shin Bet has been um, put under more legislative scrutiny and now some safeguards are in place. So for example, protecting journalists um, in Israel. 
And I think earlier we had the body which represents Israeli physicians coming out and saying that the Shin Bet's use of its surveillance powers for COVID-19 was a distraction, but also undermining the effort because they didn't essentially involve anyone from a public health agency. So they were needlessly quarantining people, including people that could be um, essential for fighting the disease. So I think that's a good example of how this kind of tech solutions and how failing to listen to the public health agencies and their expertise could lead to actually undermining the broader efforts just by relying on this flashy technology solutions. Excellent. Thank you very much. I, 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 we can't possibly end it any better than that. Um, and uh, just to people who are listening, please, if you come across any interesting stories, um, please send them in via our website and also check on our uh, website for our tracker where you can see the variety of stories and the varieties of uh, countries with the varieties of tech. Um, and we will continue to monitor not just those, but also um, we're looking at the responses to them where we have a network of partner organizations across the world who are actively working on these issues in the same way that we are and trying to push back, trying to ask hard questions and trying to make sure that this is not just yet another data grab or this is not just yet another case of tech solutionism. So thank you very much, Eden. Thanks, Gus. We will have a number of podcasts like this in the foreseeable future as we continue to track what's going on around the world when it comes to COVID-19. We also have our regularly scheduled podcasts where we'll be getting into great detail and fascinating conversations with people about other areas of technology and innovation and how they affect our rights and our lives. If you want to know more about uh, the issues discussed today, you can always visit our website and particularly look at the uh, COVID-19 tracker we have there. But you can also sign up to our mailing list by going to action.privacyinternational.org, where we specifically have a mailing list about COVID-19, amongst other mailing lists that you can sign up to. Music is courtesy Glassboy. It's licensed under Creative Commons.